Hello, everybody. Thank you all, and thank you especially to the indefatigable and unflappable Fiona for uh, <laughs> helping us so much uh, this morning. And the bad news is I've wasted all my energy <laughs> and anything I could ever say in the Gosta, and now that's done, I've nothing left to, to say or any, uh, don't expect anything creative or anything. I'm going to talk, give some academic references and do some stuff like this. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about kindness and try and unpack some ideas around this and talk a little bit about that, maybe. And I have a desert picture here and uh, I've come up with a title of Archaeologies of the Heart in Search of the Practice That Cannot Be Practiced, right? There's things we, we can't actually practice. So I, I just should say I'm an Associate Professor of Digital Learning from Dublin City University as well. My name is Eamon Costello. It's so good you here. And I'll give you a, a speculative provocation, which is imagine a world without kindness. So think about that for a minute and try and think about that idea. And what I should have called my talk was if we lived in a world without tears. Does anybody know this song? No? This is a song by Lucinda Williams. If I could sing, I would sing it for you. If I, if Rike had this lovely thing where you can jump to the future and then you can work your way back. So if I jump to the future and I could sing, I would try and sing it at not as good as the Cindy Williams. I'll try and sing it now just for a second. <laughs> if we lived in a world without tears, how would bruises find the face to lie upon? How would scars find skin to etch themselves into? How would broken find the bone? Woo so it's a lovely uh, thing about imagining something without tears. And it's a nice analogy because if we didn't have kindness, we would have some kind of an arid world, I would suggest to you, okay? Some kind of a desert landscape. So I've got a bit of desert theme going on. And although it is virtually ignored by sociologists, this is, I've got to use academic references now today. I've got to make sure I get my chops in as an academic. But this is a lovely paper by Browning and Anderson, uh, thinking sociologically about kindness. And they're sociologists, and they did some cool stuff going into libraries and looking at kindness in uh, doing audit, kindness audits. Actually, there's great research in the library literature on this. And we feel it keenly by its absence, right? So that's a kind of key theme I'll suggest to you. But this idea of presences and absences, we don't know something until it's missing. Um, so why? Why kindness? Okay. What is this about? Why should we be talking about this stuff, thinking about this? And I would suggest to you that one of the reasons I think it's important to talk about these um type of things is because of the negativity bias so we have this negativity bias a lot of modern cognitive science is telling us this about cognitive biases and the negativity bias is a big one and a classic one is i'm walking along in the forest and there's something there is that a stick or is it a snake right and nine times out of ten it's just a stick but i am primed to scan my environment for threats you know and I, I, kind of, I get this sense sometimes that every time I'm in an interaction with another person, I'm thinking, am I safe or am I unsafe? I'm asking myself these two questions. And a lot of environments we go into, we, we do this. We're asking ourselves, am I safe or am I unsafe? Okay. And like this is in education environments. I walked into my classroom this year and had this big sign, no eating or drinking in class. I was like, man, that's like, you know, and not only that, but it was on, on a piece of paper that's just blue tacked up to the wall and it looks mank. <laughs> that's ruining my room. So I took down all these signs that said no eating or drinking in class. And I brought food into the class that the students could eat. And we ate in the class. And uh, I gave the students my credit card and my PIN number and <laughs> told them to go to the shop and buy some food, right? So that we could eat in the class. And that was a kind of possibly a reckless thing to do. <laughs> But uh, I was trying to make a point as well about the signs we put up in learning spaces and what that says about us and how we feel welcome in spaces. 
And this is in online environments too, because the first thing you go into my, my online environment, my Moodle class, that the template, it says plagiarism policy, right? That's the first thing the student sees in, in the environment. So it says, we don't trust you. And we have this, we, we start building up these trustless systems. Um, and it leads to solutionism, because we have this kind of feeling of not enoughness, right? So we're always trying to fix things and fix ourselves and all this stuff. So we have this relentless solutionism. And this manifests everywhere. You see it all over the place. We're trying to just fix everything all the time. And you see, you can see this everywhere. It's great. You can see it in academic literature. We're trying to find the gaps in the literature. What is the gap? And if you look at Pat Thompson's website, where she talks about great advice for PhD researchers, she talks about other ways you can analyze literature without looking for gaps in the literature and saying we're going to find the gap and plug the gap. And it's more about problematization and stuff like that. So we could have solutionism, we could have trustless environments, or we could have appreciative inquiries. So Mags talked about appreciative inquiry yesterday, which is lovely. So I've changed the picture of the snake into a branch there, a little uh, cherry blossom. And one of the things we could do in appreciative inquiry is we could have gratitude for things, right? We could choose to pay attention because we're primed for the negativity bias. That's taken care of. You don't need to worry about worrying. You're going to do that, right? But what you need to do is tool up a little bit more. What I suggest we should do, I'm not going to tell you what you need to do, is tool up a little bit more on positivity. Why not? Why don't we give it a try, right? So we can have gratitude for things. Now, I have a lot of gratitude for Fiona for helping me. <laughs> Thank you. And also just for things like electricity. You know, there's electricity here, right? And I was at the EADTU conference with Rob and Martin and some well, Beck and lots of wonderful people this year. No, it was last year. It was in Italy. And uh, there was a lady there from Nigeria, and she was talking about the pandemic and the electricity, you know, the problems with electricity and stuff. I was like, these are problems I do not have that I don't even know I don't have. These are problems that are solved for me every single day, every moment of my life. So many, there's so much that we have, but we don't even see it, right? It's electricity. So my colleague Nargis is working on this project with me, my colleague Nargis Mohammadi from Afghanistan. She was telling me lovely stories about being in Afghanistan and going to school, university there, and uh, there are struggles with electricity and Wi-Fi. And she's a great storyteller. And like they'd be running to the shop, charge up their laptop, come home, go online to this pandemic madness, you know. And uh, she told it beautifully. And it was just like, I was like, man, we have this stuff all the time. Okay? What would happen if electricity went away? Right? We'd be in trouble. And kindness could be like this. It could be some kind of invisible human infrastructure that we have that we don't even know we have. Imagine. Now, Nargis came to Dublin. She left Afghanistan because the Taliban came in. Her university got bombed. And universities now banned in Afghanistan to women. And post-primary school, secondary school as well as banned to women now in Afghanistan since I told Nargis, Nargis, you came from the future to us because she got a degree in Kabul University and now she came to Ireland and now they're gone back into some horrible past. Right? And everything we have now, we're complaining about stuff, ah, oh, management and all this, that and the other. And I wish I was something else. I'm only an associate professor. And, ah. But we have so much, right? So, what is kindness? Uh, so I talked about maybe it's some kind of infrastructural thing that we have, okay? Appreciate it. Uh, so, Brownlee and Anderson, they said, the inverse of evil does exist, a web or infrastructure of low-level everyday kindness on, upon which much else depends. So, I... Um, so, and they give a good definition of kindness, and they uh, have a, they have their construct of kindness has four aspects to it. It's infrastructure quality, which we talked a little bit about. It's unobligated character, so it's not transactional. 
It's micro or interpersonal focus and it's atmospheric potential. This is nice. So I was going to uh, university one day and there was a guy on a bike, a delivery guy, and he dropped his phone or something. And I picked it up for him and we had this beautiful moment where we were just helping each other. I needed to, didn't need to say it to him. And it, it improved my day so much, just that little thing, you know? And it was unplanned, unconditioned. So now, so that's kindness between people, okay? Kindness is infrastructure. I'll just throw out another idea as well, which is we can have, this is a book by Robert Bea, uh, a Buddhist teacher, and he's got this idea about, about metta to phenomena. So metta is loving kindness in Pali. And uh, he's talking about this strange idea about being kind to stuff like rocks and trees and classrooms and your name badge, and all this kind of stuff, right? It's actually a brilliant idea. So he's, he's a whole book about this kind of stuff, right? And it helps because you have an inner voice, you have an orientation to things, and it's going to affect everything you do. It has this atmospheric potential. And I tried to write about a bit of this. I kind of was, guess I was influenced by Rob's work. And I wrote an article about this called Rewild My Heart with Pedagogies of Love, Kindness, and the Sun and Moon. And really, I wanted to write a comic book, but no one would let me write a comic. It's not in my job description. So I snuck a comic into the middle. I'm not saying the article was any good or anything, but I was kind of proud of the comic. And it was about a character who's being kind to the sun and the moon and starting with these things and then with words and with essays and classrooms and everything else that we have. So now we're looking at the sun until it's just the sun looking into you. So that was that. So what am I doing for time? Uh, what might be problematic about kindness? Anybody, I'm gonna pause and ask, tap into the wisdom of the OER23 crowd. <laughs> Rob, so um, drawing on philosophy a little bit, Nietzsche had some unkind things to say about kindness and the idea of sort of slave morality. Kindness is basically just there to protect weak people from strong people, establish it as a norm, um, really to sort of constrain strength and people who would otherwise dominate. And so kindness is a kind of like a weak idea you know, to protect the weak, to protect weak it's people. Fairy tale. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, well, it's a sort of inversion of Christian morality. Yes. Like in so, yeah. You know, Christianity is a dominant thing, and the Christian vir so called virtues, from Nietzsche's point of view, would be these kind of ideas that are there to constrain natural strength and natural mm -hmm. dominance. So that, that, that might be problematic. I'm not saying I agree with that necessarily, but. It's, good. it's, a, good, it's a great critique. And. Uh, I love Nietzsche, he's fantastic. Right. Dust Brack Zarathustra, one of my favorite books. I've actually read it. <laughs> Not read many books. Uh, and I guess, like, you know, we could try and have this attitude where we create all this stuff and we're going to dominate and, you know, trust this environment. We're going <coughs> to check everything and control everything and we're going to be strong and dominant and we can put on this shirt of barbed wire, you know, to protect us from our enemies and it's going to cut the shit up. <laughs> so the bit he's missing was when he had the psychotic breakdown when he was talking to a horse and he just lost it, you know. Well, the irony is he was kind to the horse. He was kind to the horse, right? There you go. <laughs> so, but yeah, there's a lot of critique of kindness. I haven't thought that one, so that's very helpful to me. Yeah, Mark. I suppose like anything, it can be weaponized and we're, we're being kind of and it's like I think you're generally like we generally do know what kindness is. You know, it's like in, it's absence is a Tory government, you know, that's kind of <laughs> but I guess they might argue they are being kind, you know, by sending people to a land or something. But you know, I mean people would weaponize like, like anything, I guess. Mm. Kindness for one group might be an unkindness for another group. Autumn Cain's weaponization of care. Yeah, this is, this is a big thing. You can use it to sell anything from student exam surveillance systems to baby monitors in cribs. Kindness washing. Yes, kindness washing. Yeah. Or just like you know, beating a child and saying, I'm doing this out of kindness to you. 
Exactly. <laughs> Got to be cruel to be kind. A lot of people say this, right? So these are some of the things. And one of the, one of, one of the ways this arises from manifest <clears throat> is sometimes we're unwilling to admit to ourselves that there could be such a thing, that it's not real. Uh, two minutes. <laughs> One at a time. And Unwin has got a beautiful stuff on this. This is an amazing report, right, by Julie Unwin. Kindness, emotion, human race, the blind spot in public policy. It's wonderful. And she tackles a lot of these critiques and she talks about how we can integrate this stuff, right? So I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about this project that I have very quickly, a small funded project funded by Scotland's Standing Conference on Teacher Education, North and South, Queen's University, Belfast, Dublin City University. It's called Kindred Spirit. And I'm talking to student educators here in Dublin City University, my wonderful university. We have 130 education, uh, 130 faculty members who are educators. This is one of the biggest faculties of education in Europe with 4,000 student educators. And these are my two archaeologists. I mentioned Nargis. Ruby's an undergrad student with me. They're around, they're doing vox pops around the campus, talking to people, what does kindness mean to you? This is a way we could get ethical approval, a low key guerrilla style interviews. We are doing this collection of kindness and we're going to build some kind of speculative world out of this when we get all the data back and analyze from our students. And we're going to have an event in Belfast on June 16th that you're very welcome to come to. Um, so I'm at about 16 minutes there. Yes, all about four or five minutes for QA if you're watching. Okay, to so I zoomed a little bit through some of that there. Uh, sorry about that. But any more comments or questions, or please tell me. Any more slides? What does kindness mean to you? And I think the other thing, Martin, you were talking about there as well. I'll just respond to that question a little bit as well, right? I don't want to throw in too many ideas, but you have, there is this thing where we have a near enemy of kindness. So we could have something. So you've got far enemies and near enemies. So like, say, this is called the Brahma Viharas. This is a thing from Buddhist thought. It's a great structure, great framework, great map. But you can have loving kindness, right? And ill will is the obvious thing. You you would hate someone. But then there's sentimentality. That's the near enemy, the one that's harder to see. Or if it's compassion, you know, oh, I, I care, I have compassion for somebody. And the far enemy of compassion is cruelty, but the near enemy is pity. And I'll tell you the difference between compassion and pity. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have someone show you compassion or someone pity? No one wants to be pitied. And that where you're talking about governments or people weaponizing stuff. They're not, they're not, we're not talking about the same thing. You know, I often wonder walking around my beautiful campus, why we can't be enjoying this. Yeah. There's very few people enjoying this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think, wow, you know, with all the human potential that here's here and the grounds that we have, like, why are we all so miserable? Uh, and so I, I, I do believe in this infrastructure. I, I, I really do. Um, and I, I think actually if anyone were to make me a university president, I, I think I would talk about kindness a lot. It's all we have, really. To make, uh, make everybody their best, so. Mm -hmm. But I did, you know, I had spent 10 years in the US, and I would say the predominant philosophy there at the moment is sort of an Ayn Rand, uh, Ayn Rand um, uh, if you're being kind, you're being unkind, right? Because you're not maximizing your utility, and that's what kindness is. So it's, it's odd, it's the near enemy. And it is, there is like something about kindness as well. It is, it does, it is vulnerability. It hurts a little bit. So that's the Cindy Williams song puts it beautifully. Like if you lived in a world without tears, you know, because it is going to hurt a little bit to get there. That's the problem. And people don't want to experience that hurt. So they just say, no, we're going to just, we got to be cruel to be kind. That's right. I'm just thinking about, um, you know, how we kind of think about kindness. And so far, I've just sort of been thinking of it as, I guess, sort of interpersonal thing 
But you have also examples of kindness towards non-human species, towards environments as a whole. And this kind of taps into some of the stuff from you know, yesterday, where it's like, and it's also something that you see in sort of environmental ethics. Right? Traditionally in philosophy, ethics is something that happens between people. <coughs> Only people are morally sort of valid agents. But you, with the emergence of environmental ethics, you get this idea of, no, something like a forest can be morally <coughs> valuable in its own right. It doesn't require the opinions of humans about it to be, you know, have any ethical significance. Um, so you could sort of have a kindness towards environments or animals or plants and that kind of thing. But I can also see how it becomes a sort of, I don't know if paradox is going too far, but you know, what do you do? You never mow the lawn because you don't want to be unkind to the grass. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. where do you draw the line between yeah. this and say, actually, kindness to the environment is sometimes going to involve just oh, the devil's work, man. They're as bad as golf courses. Um, but it's going to involve sometimes destruction of, of things. Right, and that can be seen as a, in a way it's a variation on that kind of spanking a child thing. Yeah, it's for your own good. <laughs> you know, I'm harming you, but it's for your own good. It's done out of kindness. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm re-diverting the river, but it's for your own good. All these animals that live nearby and rely on it, mm -hmm. you know, because this environment's not sustainable or something. Um, so it's very sort of convoluted and much much messier than the idea of just sort of being nice. It is. You know? It is. It's very it's very convoluted. It's very difficult. Yeah, Thank you. Really interesting exploration there. Uh, you mentioned basically appreciative inquiry and make mm. that link. And by what comes from research, do you think there, there's an opportunity maybe to look at appreciation and learning? And how how could we uh, make that as part of how we, we learn at university, for example? Do you see value in that? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. I have to think about that. It's a great. Because we focus a lot on the problems, like you said. Yeah, we you do. Know, blame yeah. 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 But we don't yeah. appreciate. We don't appreciate and honor honor those solutions that people already have. You know, the solutions that people are finding, whatever is getting people through. You know, whatever people are using to to, because we have our own. Like Dave was saying, we have the solution. We want you to pass the test. But people are constantly creative and coming up with cool stuff that works for them in their context and in their very good find ways to do that. You're right. I agree. It'd be wonderful. So what would you suggest? Any specific ways forward? I, I was just thinking of uh, this appreciative inquiry and um, I, I had to do like a, what do you call it, a 360, uh, you know, where every, and I looked at all these questions that I was supposed to ask my colleagues and I was like, none of these, well, I wouldn't say none of these apply to me, but this is not what I want to know. So I made my own list um, based upon appreciative inquiry about things that people do, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, enjoy or whatever. And now that you're asking this question, it's like, what would happen if instead of giving a test, you would ask students to make up their own questions that they think would be good to ask the teacher about them or something like that? I don't know if it's possible, but... One thing that I've done recently is when I'm doing an online lecture, if you will, I get I invite students from my class to come in and interview me, and I tape that instead. So what I find is when the students watch that now, they can actually put themselves in that position. I'm like, is that, that would be me, right? And, and it's just, a, you know, there's a lot more laughing happening uh, with that back and forth. So the videos that I actually post online now have two or three or four people in them, and they're, hey, it's your turn. You know, these, <laughs> this group, you're, you're going to interview me, uh, and then we post that. So I, I find that interesting. It's, it's a kinder approach. It's more appreciative. Approach. It's been really thoughtful, actually. You're just talking about the lawn there. So, yeah, I just saw somebody this morning at, like, quarter to eight for the lawn, and I thought, that's it. Here we go. Hay fever time, so that's maybe why I'm a bit husky. Nothing to do with the fact that I get dragged out last night at all. Um, <laughs> sitting with my can iron boot, um, but not yeah, um, for that. So, thank you very much for that. It was a lovely start to the morning. Thank you. It can be quite stuffy. Get up and stretch, <laughs> it's good.
Great. Thanks very much for, for coming along to this. I mean, my head's full of it. Well, all the presentations I've been to, but I think plenary this morning and now this. Uh, so yeah, now for something completely different. Um, I'm going to give a, a bit of a run through of what's the start of a pilot project. I'm trying, in fact, not to speak for entire, the entire 15 minutes and give as much time for you to ask me uh, the, the questions that are actually on your mind, quite possibly not the things that are in my talk. So my name is Tracy Madden. I'm a learning technology advisor at the University of Edinburgh. I work in the central team and we support what are supported services, uh, supported learning technology. Uh, with various kinds of advice that help you out if you get So digital badges are by no means new and I'm sure we'll have plenty of experts in the room who know far more than I do. But for anyone who's not been involved with them, I'll do a very quick recap. So uh, a digital badge is an award for having, say, completed a course or achieved something like some kind of skill or upping your skill level. Now they have all the information that's on an image. So I'm wearing a, another kind of badge. So they contain all this information that's on the image of the badge. But these kind of badges are a bit thin. Digital badges have an extra dimension of what's called metadata. So they have extra data baked into them. It's not a separate level. It's part and parcel of the badge. Now, this is great for those people who are trying to share what they've done, what they know. This could be, uh, say, looking to, to get a fellowship, looking to uh, get a job. CV, as uh, I've just been looking at CVs from people looking at internships uh, with us, and there's not a lot of space to make your claim. And badges can be a way of using that space quite wisely because the badge is quite small, but behind it can be a lot more information. Now we know that some people are going to have to verify that you actually, that is your badge and you earned it. And because this metadata is baked in, they are easily verifiable for those people who have to do that job. We've just started a pilot project for three years. It really just started this semester. The aim of the project is to focus on recognition of non-credit or extracurricular um, skills, achievements, competencies, i.e. not the credit bearing stuff, which is already recognized and already awarded, awarded and rewarded. But there's a lot of other things that learners do, which just move through the cracks, but this, we're finding there's an awful lot of it. We're also supporting the growing interest or the re-emergence of interest in recognition of um, through using digital badges and exploring how badge pathways, collections of badges, progressions of badges, and skills frameworks could enhance the value of badges. And that's the value to the people who earn them and the value to the awarding body or part thereof. Our strategy is threefold. One, scalability, co-creation, and agility. We're a, quite a small team and a very large university. There is no way that on our own, we could serve all the needs of the entire university. At the project level, we can, we're quite small, but we're building the way we mean to go on with something that we can bit by bit scale up to eventually we could serve the needs of the whole entire university if they all wanted to get on board. We're using co-creation because we want not this to be a service we deliver to people but that we become the service as a wider group of users. So everybody has a part of it. And that's by not having a lot of answers uh, to begin with, which chimes with what started this morning. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more of that. So that what we build is actually representative of the people that are involved with it, not just the central team. We also want to be agile because we're creating things as we go to make sure we are where we need to be, reflect on what we've done, make appropriate adjustments before we move forward. So in this pilot phase, as I said, we really only just started, but we have gathered colleagues from across the university. We've tried to make sure we have a really diverse range of people who've expressed an interest. And they've taken one of the three roles, our so-called early adopters, champions, and a governance group. And between all of us and the central supporting team, we're co-designing and testing the resources for this project. 
This will be concluded by summer 23, and any of the feedback gathered that we can't make immediate use of, we'll be using to inform the next phase. So our early adopters are people who want to make and issue badges. When we met with them, we said, we want to run a workshop with you, make sure that this is what you want to do, but mostly because we want you to tell us what you want from this. So we asked them various kinds of open-ended questions, and they included things like, what did they understand by digital badges? What did they think they were? Uh, why were they interested in the first place? Why not use certificates? What activities they wanted a badge? And what value they felt badges could give the earner and the university? Um, this created a great deal of information from us and it's been an invaluable first step. Before we started anything, find out what other people think this is before you build something. We also found that there is a great deal of diversity um, across these questions. Um, we're talking to people that perhaps we haven't spoken to before. We wanted all these people to be included in this. And we know there's many parts of the university we haven't yet spoken to. So we knew this was both an opportunity and a challenge. Whatever we built had to bring in this diversity of understanding and not crush it by giving them a very narrow model, which they would, if they wanted to stay involved, they'd have to fit into. This is much more challenging, but personally, I think it's a lot more exciting. We also were told when we spoke to other universities who have already done this, that value is an incredibly important thing to focus on right at the beginning. But likewise, we didn't have a definition of what value is, we just knew it was important. And that we knew that together with everybody who's involved, we're going to have to work out what value is, how it's expressed, because otherwise we're just imposing something it's, uh, and it just becomes a rule that people follow rather than something they really understand and live. So our champions. So having champions uh, is going to be absolutely uh, key to us having a scalable service because as i say small team centrally we can't support everyone so we have a sort of devolved um situation where the champions will take on responsibilities of their own they'll support their local colleagues with uh, understanding badges and then with the practical business of creation creation and issuing them uh, but again we haven't given them a strict job definition by them doing this work they are working out what the role is and therefore informing us that if we have this um, devolved situation what champions need and what we need to do to support them last but not least is a governance group this is to provide oversight uh, but more importantly it's to stop us accidentally creating silos because it's such a big university some things just end up living in the school or a college not because anybody's hiding it's just it's just like that there's so much good stuff out there but it ends up being invisible to most of the university so this governance group it's sort of by stealth they're going to see all the applications for badges and yes, they're going to look to make sure that people have expressed the value of the badge to the earner, to the university. But more importantly, they're going to get sight across the university and both help give some uh, reflection on what this badge description looks like to somebody who just doesn't work in the business school, say. So that's really important. But also stop this accidental siloing of things and, and help keep people talking to one another, even after the pilot stage. <coughs> we're also know these are, are quite well connected people around the university. This is going to help them see these kinds of activities through which one could earn a badge. OK, but it's the activity that's the important thing. Then the governance group know about it. They can pass the word on about what's going on. They may be able to bring something back. Ah, you're doing this activity. Do you know over in that building over there, this is going on? So if you're asking people to volunteer, there's got to be something for them. And our governance group are amazingly for very, very busy people, very, very keen to do more than we're asking them to do, which is uh, enough. Uh, also, a question about volunteering um, will come up a bit later. In fact, right now, even at this early stage, I think we've learned quite a lot. It's 
it's been vitally important to not start with a thing, but talk to other people who've already built things and find out what went right, what went wrong. And we're really grateful for people being so open about sharing, you know, the good and the bad. We want to keep that going. We want to be really open about um, what we've done, what we've not done, um, because this just keeps this whole thing going um, and just just for you know more productive. The scaling does depend on other people taking on responsibility. The thing is that you know that some people are very good at volunteering and helping you out, but there is always a problem that volunteers offer to do too much. And it then, this is a risk to a project, but hopefully with an agile approach, we can keep an eye on this and to make sure if it's gonna be dangerous to scale to wider, if we need to change our approach, get other people involved because we do, need to take care of the project but we need to take care of our colleagues who you know, we want to make sure they don't get overloaded that's that's no good for anybody it shouldn't be underestimated how much work this kind of thing takes and because we're not just writing down rules and, and sending it out and say this is how it's done this is what value means a badge is worth 50 hours of work plus a test plus a reflective blog post that would be so easy and some people would actually probably appreciate it if we just tell them how it's done. But that's not really what we're here for. So sitting with a group of people and saying, well, what do you think value means? And saying, no, really, we do have to talk about that is going to be so much better. People will have something they can truly relate to and they're truly part of. But it is uncomfortable because people are not being used to as we said this morning, not being used to ask questions where somebody actually doesn't have the answer to start with and is not going to answer it for you. Also, we found we're bringing together colleagues um, who are from different, let's say, different traditions, different bits of the university. Uh, they've been working in that environment and they, they are, are being brought up in a particular tradition and forgetting that it's just one tradition. So now we're bringing those people together with people from other the university, and they're seeing things which to them are challenging. They believe they have rigorous practices. And then when they see what happens in another part of the university, this, this mention of lack of rigor turns up. So some places they want a high degree of control. That's how they do it. And they believe it's right and, and has the best results. They come across somewhere else where things are a lot more open and uh, a lot more up to discussion and it, it jars with them but again again we could make it easy by going for the easy choices the traditional choices that don't scare anybody but that's not the point is it if somebody has very strict lines on something maybe they need to be open to the more possibilities they are and if we're going to work together these badges need to work across the university and some of the strict guidelines they have in parts of university will completely push out, I think, some of our more <coughs> interesting badging situations with ideas about demonstrating <coughs> your skills, ideas about what is assessment are very, very non-traditional. We have already got a very highly controlled system for our credit-based courses. We do not need to build another one. This is for everything else that gets left out. We don't want to squeeze out by building a system, build on the old lines because it makes some people comfortable. So we want to have those tricky conversations about rigor and about making this a richer project by, by thinking and doing things in new ways. This is a slow, slow process though, I must admit. It will be easy to just make the rules. And I've been told that was just under five minutes um, and I'm willing to take any questions away or provocations or statements, um, that's just fine. I'm also findable through many different means. Um, I'm on uh, Bluebird, but also on Mastodon, if you try and contact me that way. Uh, <laughs> haven't quite let go, sorry. <laughs> Yes, yeah, you just mentioned um, your traditional uh, systems of um, probably uh, it, handing out certificates mm. and then now the badges. Mm. And how does that combine or not? Is Well, again, we're, we're saying to people, like, do you, do you reward, um, do you award 
um, you can be in. You can keep your certificate if you want that as well. Uh, do you want to switch from a certificate? Why is that? Uh, for some people, it's, well, this is just so much more shareable. I mean, I'm sharing my badge right now. Doesn't work at the back of the room. Um, for some people, they, they have an idea of offering a badge to students. It will be digital badges are controlled by the person who's been given the badge. If I don't want to share my badge, I don't have to. But they think, well, this could be something that students would maybe like to share. It would also, in some cases, help other students, or I should say learners, know about this opportunity. There is a marketing angle. Um, as some of these things I say live within the university and it's difficult to get word out, but you see a badge and think, I'd like to do that. So it is a way of getting opportunities out of soft selling uh, things wider. Does that mean that I can, as a student, choose for a certificate and a badge or, 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 or? Yeah, with the, with the platform that we're using, I mean, it's, it happens to be uh, that it will both issue a badge and a certificate so people can take what they want. So yeah, they can make that choice. And if people want to issue, because they might actually, oh, oh, the platform certificate might be a bit dull. If you want to award and reward in another way as well, you can. We're absolutely not trying to, well, if you come into our system, you have to play by the rules. No, you, you can do the other thing as well. And you don't have to join. If you've got your own badging project going, which some people have in the university, you can carry on. It's, it, that's just fine. Or you can do both. Um, we don't want to stop anyone. Yes. But what do students do with their badges once they've earned them? Right. Now, we're going to give them guidance as to what they could do. Uh, so there's practical things about just getting that <coughs> into things. So the possibilities are you can put it in, say, your, your LinkedIn profile, which some parts of university very much encourage students to get LinkedIn profiles. You might be able to imagine where that is. For some people, it's putting it into their signature lines in um, their um, any, any messages. Um, could be email. You could put it into your CV. Um, you could just keep it because the other thing about badges is it's a way of somebody saying, you know, you did a thing. Um, you know, you did a real thing. And I find, as I say, from looking at students uh, cvs last week and knowing the students have worked with on projects with us they're, they're some of them really quite shy i think about I think a lot of people uh, staff as well find it very hard to talk about themselves and their achievements and it can be that badges can help them recognize um what they just did and and recognize their own achievement um you know our students are really really smart but some you know may not be as confident as us yes thank you um would you be able to give an example of the platform that you're using for the badges and also um, a couple examples of um, what people have earned badges for? Right. We've not yet issued badges because, as you say, we're taking the slow route to people, you know, working out what their jobs are. The issue in the badge bit is going to be cut and paste data into the platform, press the button. That The tech is easy. There are many platforms. Uh, we have gone with what was called Badger. I think you've got to work out what's appropriate. There's, there's a lot of things, including money, um, involved. Uh, but a lot of different examples. So please ask me later as I need to move. My time is up in Australia. It is up in the last question, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be a lot of different things. And as I say, the, the diversity of activities that people want to badge, we didn't expect and, and we want to be ready not to push things out because these are the things already not included. Thank you. Thank you very much. Still not enough time. I think, I think all the sessions, I think, yesterday and today have been the same. It's just been so, uh, <laughs> so informative. You're helping me. Okay. I'd like to create a Lucinda Williams. Well, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. If anybody does that, yes. the songs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, a few on my playlist too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be fine because the next session is going to be karaoke. Yeah. Yeah. 15 minutes with a five QA. Yeah. So in 10 minutes, I'll get to the five. Is that okay? Yeah, oh, perfect. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'm going to adapt. Over to yourself. And if people want to move beyond the session, beyond the exam mm -hmm. session, don't only work for it. Hi, everyone. I'm Joanne Kehoe. I work at McMaster University, which is in 
southern Ontario, uh, Canada, <coughs> um, about an hour west of Toronto, um, in Hamilton, Ontario, which is the capital of capital city of waterfalls. If anybody has a burning desire to come to Hamilton, um, but the, uh, there's a bitly link too if you wanted to follow along or grab any of the info I'm sharing. It's beyond the exam OER 23. Um, the, the waterfalls are also um, in, in, uh, in Canada, it's, it's very important to us as our steps towards truth and reconciliation to acknowledge the lands that we, we are gathering on. So McMaster's campus is on the land, traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and the Mississauga nations. And that image that you see there is the wampum belt. So it's the dish with one spoon wampum agreement that binds us to those lands. And uh, so it's a symbolic, um, intricate beadwork done by the Haudenosaunee peoples. And the center represents the dish, the circle, and the, the spoon is in the, in the middle. And that represents the idea of sharing and peace. So I, it's not just a token <laughs> land acknowledgement. I always think that this is the grounding of some of the work that we do and I try to do and make sure that the traditional ways of knowing are embedded in the work. And that really, I think, um, is illustrated with work in, in OER open education. So let's take a little journey back in time. Um, for some of you, it might be a longer journey <laughs> going back to your higher education experience, but uh, just think about your assessments when you're undergrad, graduate school, maybe even high school, maybe even primary school. Um, what was the most, uh, the most valuable assessment or the coolest assignment, I guess? Maybe what you felt you learned the most from, you felt like the work that you invested in it, um, you know, truly reflected a learning experience. You had some deeper learning going on there. So think about that. Some, it might be, you might have to take through some cobwebs. I had to. Um, I'll just pause for a second to think about your coolest assignment. <laughs> All right. So who, show of hands, who thought an exam was their, their best assignment? <laughs> what about um, a presentation that you had to do in front of a group? Um, an experiential learning opportunity where you were actually doing a field, yeah, a couple of more, yeah, great. Um, an essay or a paper, still a few, okay. Um, what about a project, project-based learning? Yeah, so that's, that's usually the, I get the most for that. And what about development of a portfolio? Yeah, yeah, that's a valuable one too. And is, are there any others that I'm not captured there that I'd like to hear about them? What, what, what one were you thinking of? your adventure story. Oh, wow. Choose your own adventure story. So you could just make up your own assignment, basically, kind of align to some outcomes. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was it, what it was supposed to illustrate was already set. And it was the first assignment where I didn't want to stop writing. Wow. That is rare. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking back, I, I don't want to reveal where I went for undergrad, but I, I couldn't think of a good one from, and I was like, it was all exams. It was all exams. So anyways and that is traditionally what we have so how this project evolved is a picture of my wonderful colleague in ontario who julia Forsyth, who works at brock university um she does a lot of like visual thinkery type brian mathers stuff with her website edudoodle she was doing a doodle around the start of the pandemic thinking about all of these you know the top how you so you need to put your exam online in march 2020 this frantic like i need to i can't get let go of my exam it has to stay and it has to be online it has to be proctored and so we were talking about it we meet, met weekly as a group of people working in digital learning um and uh kind of commiserated and and shared the kindness that <laughs> was, was happening with each other as we went through that. Um, so those conversations, also the rise against proctoring, we all know, I won't go into detail how problematic uh, proctoring was as a short-term solution, but was a short-term solution many people turn to um, with privacy issues, equity issues, you know, the built-in AI biases that we all have heard about and technical issues for students who just can't access robust internet. So we wanted to kind of look at other alternatives. I was fortunate to work at a university where, although we did adapt to proctoring software, we had to, it was an application based. So you had to, you had to um, request access and prove why you couldn't think of an alternative, which I think was a good approach. Um, also, we know that as many of us, I um, work in, I should have said in my introduction, <laughs> I, do, I do teach some uh, classes in digital literacy at McMaster but I also uh, largely support faculty. So a, a big group of us, maybe some of in this room, we're supporting 
instructors with this rapid switch to remote teaching. So there was a lot of this, those faces help in looking like I need some help in reconsidering my assessments that are normally in person to an online format. And I don't know what to do. I need instructions, I need rubrics. There's that abundance issue that we were talking earlier about this morning and how to kind of grapple with what's out there. I also need help with the technology. Like, I don't know what to use. I'm learning all these things. So yeah, I was thinking even about when you're talking about kindness, like the, the emotional labor that's involved sometimes in being kind. Uh, you know, a 10 minute consultation with a faculty member turns into an hour long and we're all crying at the end. So, so yeah, it's, it's wanting to support. We also wanted to advocate for good pedagogy, which we know alternative authentic assessments are good ways to teach. Lots of choice around universal design for learning, um, the thinking of the blooms levels, higher order thinking skills, not uh, actually deep learning and not just cramming for a, a, an exam. But we also recognize the time investment. It's, it's easy to say to an instructor, you need to consider an alternative. Go away and do your thing. You have to think there's a lot of labor involved in coming up with instructions, examples, uh, directions for students. So we were lucky in Ontario to have some provincial funding available through eCampus Ontario, which is a hub for the publicly funded colleges and universities and Indigenous institutes. Uh, great colleagues again at Brock University, College Boreal, which is a Francophone college in Northern Ontario, and my, ourselves um, applied and got the funding to develop um, this alternative assessment toolkit. So this, there's the link beyondtheexam.ca if you want to check it out. Um, it's really divided into two main sections. One is the design perspective. So we have a student involved in the project who wrote a piece on, on from her perspective. We have an instructional designer write a chapter and then an instructor. And then the, the bulk of the toolkit is around the examples. So the student perspective was great. We had this wonderful student, Savta. Um, she wrote a very funny piece on Professor T-Rex, you know, marking up the exam with red pen and and just the experience of the student feeling judged and critiqued and not really learning or actively engaged in her in her assessment. So it's a wonderful way to open up the, the toolkit. We also have the instructional design part, which is the Bloom's taxonomy. And we, you know, we we saw a lot as instructional designers or people who work in learning design. People say that they're doing creating, evaluating, analyzing in their learning outcomes, but in actuality, they have you know an exam that's remembering and understanding it. So good attentions, but um, how to actually do that? So we this I think it's from Arizona State University. This Bloom's digital taxonomy. So trying to come up with those digital ways of in, in reimagining assessment. And then we had this one uh, amazing faculty member from Brock University, Maureen Connolly, who teaches in their gender studies and recreation programs. I think. Um, so she wrote um, this piece on after week eight consolidate, which I have taken. I was like, this is what I have to tell everybody to do. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but this is kind of how she mapped it out. Um, you know, finding out what students knew already coming into the class at the beginning first few weeks then doing some low stakes assessments, some practice, um, the threshold comp concepts toward the kind of, I guess, second third of the course and then no new material being introduced after that so after week eight you're consolidating all that you know and you're doing the app practical application and yeah you deal will go into that we all know that is um so we have lots of examples in our in our toolkit there's some of them kind of highlighted there looking for more that's my first seed of come on and contribute um <laughs> Each exam, exemplar include, includes those blooms levels, so we tag them. Um, a description, um, facilitation tips. So if an instructor has provided one and did a board game assignment, just, just reflecting on what worked well, what maybe they need to do differently next time, how students re responded. Um, a criteria, so a rubric often, or some measurements of, of learning, and then some examples. So some frames of reference that you could build in. Uh, a couple, I won't go into a lot of detail, but a couple of my favorites were a mind mapping um, assignment at the end of a course, which was accompanied by a reflective paper, but, you know, mapping out all the topics in the course and doing some um, color coding and symbolizing of, of how the knowledge was gained. See a line above the door there. Um, also, podcast, which I think 
probably many of you have used, but just talking about some of the, the technical um, ways to to um, facilitate a pod, um, having students create a podcast as, as an assignment. And then one of my favorites because is a multimodal culminating project. So giving students a choice, kind of a choose your own adventure a little bit, you know, how do you kind of take the, the key concepts in the course and make a project you can do any way you want. You could do a, an art piece, you could do a podcast, you could do a video, you could do many things. You could do a comic book. Um, so yes, yeah, so now we are, um, I, I thought because we're only in a short session, but if you want to, and you have access to the slides, there's an activity, if you're thinking about reconsidering your alternative assessment or helping faculty, there's a bit of a guiding, um, it's based on the art of interrogation, which is on the BC campus. Um, so just a guided prompts, kind of talking about your original assessment, what your goals are, something new ways you can reimagine and that can help with uh, reframe, re reconsidering a new, uh, a, a new assessment design. So what's beyond, beyond the exam? We're coming up with version two, um, uh, workshop design. So a third uh, piece part of the press book will be an actual you know, slides and facilitation tips. If you wanna offer a alternative assessment workshop on your, at your institution. We also wanna categorize the assessments. Right now it's just a big um, laundry list of things. And I was working on another project with Terry Green, um, who's, who's a great, you may know him from Trent. Um, yay, Terry. And he, he has this uh, takeout menu at the, at the beginning of his, uh, it's a liberated learner project. And it's great because you can, once you open, you know, press books, sometimes it's difficult to find what you need. So it's, it's like a, kind of checking off what you need. I need an assessment that is a group project that's online that is um, culminating. It's, so we're looking at trying to categorize, categorize it a bit better as it grows. Some more exemplars are on the way. So please, I have four. I was hoping we're going to be ready by this, but they're just being written up right now um, from OE Global. Some great participants there offers to contribute. I'd love it if we had more. Um, there's some additional resources if you want. Or oh, I just wanted to show you actually just before we, how you can contribute right here the website if you did take a chance or uh, get a chance to open her up um, is here and there's a french and a english version so you can both languages and there's a this is what i wanted to highlight right here submit an alternative online assessment you'll be directed to a form just saying hey i'm so and so from such and such university i'd like to contribute that's all you have to do i would contact you and interview you and we work out together how to to get that added into the mix so that's it i know i'm at time right time's up yeah okay so please reach out if you need to if you want to talk more there i am on various mechanisms thank you very much thank you. i know we don't have time for questions so <laughs> just thank you yeah. have a good day questions are going out unfortunately so thank you